uh, praise and worship and learn more of uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome all you that's watching live out there on Facebook. And uh, we just ask if you just are able, if you want to stand and join us as we sing some songs before we get into our message. him coming and dying for us on that cross where would we be it's because he first loved us that we can be found in him and we can have eternal life with him and we should be daily daily just being at his feet just praising and worshiping him and um, being hungry for what he has for us to you for us. 
been a t- in a time in your life where like you're just longing and thirsting for something, nothing satisfies. When you go to Jesus, he will satisfy your every need, your every want. He's always there for us. You know, and everyone needs, like the song says we're about to sing, everyone needs compassion. And that's what God calls us to do. He calls us to serve the humble, the weak, the poor, the downcast. Everyone needs the love that Jesus has shown us. And he has called us to be his hands and feet in this place, to love those, to show compassion and mercy and grace to those that we come in contact with. God can do anything. He can move any mountain that's in your way. He can provide anything you need that's standing in your way from serving him. If you just come to him and you say, here I am, God. I surrender it all to you. Use me and fill me in the way that you want to use me and fill me.
is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Our Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. We just praise you in this place today, God. We thank you, God, for waking us up, for breathing the breath of life in us, for allowing us to come here, for allowing us to praise and worship you, for allowing us to gather together even in the midst of this crazy pandemic. We just pray, Father, your blessing on our service today. We pray, Father, that you would keep us all safe, Lord, that you would protect us, Lord, while we're out and about. But first and foremost, God, that you would allow your light to shine through us, that we can share the hope of the love of Jesus Christ with everyone in this world because they need your hope. They need your love. They need to know that they are worthy of your love and your grace. So I just pray, God, as Pastor Mike comes forward and he, he shares your message that you have given him today, that you would just speak through him, Lord, and not only speak through him, but speak to us. Open up our hearts, open up our eyes and our ears to hear that message, Lord. And I pray, Father, that that message, Lord, will grow and flourish and that it will go out from us into all this world and everyone that you have placed in our path. So we just give this service to you. Thank you for being here. We thank you, Father, for your love. And we ask, Lord, that you would just guide and direct and bless everything. And we ask all this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And amen. Can you hear me now? <laughs> well, it looks like we've got a decent crowd out here today. Good to see Jay and Sheena. Are those your partners in crime? Okay, glad to see you guys. <laughs> As always, God is good. And all the time. Amen. He's been especially good this week. <laughs> I think Lulu and myself uh, have uh, sprung some leaks in our uh, water system, and we're on city water, so it's until what kind of bill we're going to get. <laughs> I had one this week, too. Well, I say hello to everyone out there in cyberspace, uh, Facebook, YouTube, wherever you might be, welcome here today. Glad to have all you guys. We're going to talk about a workbench. Eddie, I think I left my, I did leave laying up or didn't I? My pointer. <laughs> I'll catch it. We're going to have to hit it a few times anyway, won't we? <laughs> Thank you. All right. 
I say most of us uh, growing up can remember uh, maybe dad's workbench or mom's special drawers of tools and the corner of the garage being the basement with some basement kitchen where things just kind of cobbled together and set there on, on display. Maybe a cluttered drawer here and there and you know, as little kids, I can remember that we were always fascinated uh, by those things. And as we grew up, we probably learned to, to ignore it. But chances are that somewhere in there you learned by way of hammering and hitting the wrong nail. And I did that not too long ago. They say you can always tell a carpenter and a mechanic by their nails where they uh, hit him with a hammer or wrench slips off of a bolt and then you got your knuckles to all the pieces. I can remember that. I can remember growing up, you know, Dad taught us how to do things. Now, I was uh, shocked by, and I can't remember who he was. It's been a little while back. We were talking and um, there son, I'm pretty sure his son, had a flat tire. And they had to call someone to come and change the flat tire. I thought, that doesn't sound right. Because as I was growing up, my brother's growing up, and I'm sure a lot of you growing up, you were taught things by your parents. Whether it's changing a, a uh, flat tire or Changing the oil in the car. One of my favorite things that I, to do now that I didn't used to do is grow a garden, knowing how to far apart to plant the seeds and how much fertilizer to put on it and when to hoe it and when not to hoe and all that stuff. And and believe it or not, you know, Mom told my brother and I, sorry, we have we have no. Uh, Girls, so you guys are going to have to do some ironing, <laughs> do some housework. And uh, thankfully, Mom made us iron our underwear. <laughs> and I, for the life of me, I said, Mom, nobody's going to see them. You never know what might happen. Iron our underwear. That was mom now. I got a few little snapshots, I think. I think. There we go. That's my dad, for those of you that don't know. Of course, he's peeling on his motorcycle. Our dad was one of those guys that was a, a jack of all trades and a master of none. He could do a little bit of everything. And, uh, and I learned a little bit from him. <laughs> But uh, then mom taught my brother how to cook breakfast her way. And I can tell you, by the time she was through with him, his breakfast and mom's breakfast, you couldn't tell them apart. And I, I told him the other day, I said, uh, you're going to have to come back up and fix us breakfast, I guess. And he said, I haven't fixed breakfast since mom passed away. And he said, I'd probably have to... I'd probably burn it, but uh, but that's that's the way our moms and dads were. They they taught us to do things, and so I, of course, I had to teach my daughter how to use a saw and paint. And yeah, we didn't have any boys, so uh, Shayla was helping me build my uh, my shelves in my garage. So works out pretty good. <laughs> but we learn. We learn as we are growing up, but it's hammering on a nail and the correct nail, not the wrong nail. Holding a saw. I was uh, last, I think it was last spring, or spring before last, I was trimming the trees across the uh, creek from my house because it was kind of hanging over into the creek and I was wanting to get them cleaned up. And I had 
probably about 90% of them uh, cleaned up, and there was some briars in there. And of course, I was using the chainsaw, and, and thankfully, I was not giving it the gas. It was just kind of idling, and I was scraping through those briars, and of course, uh, it landed on my leg. And thankfully, I wasn't giving it fuel, or it probably would have done a whole lot of damage. It probably needed about four stitches, but Charlotte, Christine's sister, came to the rescue and put some black tape on it and duct tape on it, and I was fine. <laughs> Got a little dirt on it, too. <laughs> well, chances are that you've learned things like that growing up by just watching. Watching calloused hands at work, and not just telling you, but showing you how the work is done. And thankfully that that um, our parents was like that. And, uh, and and Dad would say, hey, I'm not going to do it for you. You're going to learn to do it. And he would make sure that we did that. So much of the Apostle Paul's writing was to people that he knew well. These weren't just people who who had heard of him or respected him as a church administrator, but they knew him. He had founded those churches in person and discipled those people firsthand. He didn't just tell them about the gospel. He lived it. He lived it in front of them. He didn't just describe the fruits of the spirits. He displayed them. He gave them a, an example to follow, and sometimes with words, but always with action. And that's something that uh, is an excellent example when you back up what you say by your actions. You know, one of the ways they did, did this was by working with his hands. Through most of his uh, missionary career, Paul was a what? He was a tent maker, that's right. You know, the fact is known, known so well that people in bivocational ministry today are called tent makers. There's th three of us here, <laughs> at least. But Paul grew up in Tarsus of, of Cis Sicilia, a place that exported goat's hair fabric that are used to make tents. That makes sense, doesn't it? That you work in a place where you can do that. He grew up around the trade and probably learned when he was very young. You know, this was the solid, sweaty work of his hometown. Tent makers, like everyone else in those days, worked long, hard hours from sunup to sundown. You know, he preached in the synagogue on the Sabbath but he probably did a lot of discipleship and teaching at his workbench, which is what we do here with our soup kitchens and things. That the other things that we do, uh, we get an opportunity to tell people about Jesus. Now, for example, he probably said, hey, sir, could you come over here and hold this rope for me? And I'll tell you all about Jesus. I can see Paul doing that. Can you? Yeah. Or come and pull this rope a little bit tighter so I can stitch this seam, and I'll tell you about the Messiah. You know, I've got a neighbor that uh, you know, lives below me, and I can, he always will get a kick out of that. He put up a chain link fence, but he put a gate up from his yard to my yard. And he said, that's what neighbors are for. You don't put fence up till you can't get from one, one yard to the other. So he put a gate up. We always get a kick out of that. And I would say nine times out of ten, when uh, we are out in the yard, typically when we carry on a conversation, it takes a while because we get started and we're talking about a little bit of everything. And, and I'd say probably... Nine times out of ten, it ends up we're talking about church. Now, he goes to a different church, belongs to a different church than, than what I do, but hey, we're all going to the same place, right? 
So what difference does it make? But we can sit down and have some really good conversations. And, and so that's what we should be doing when we're out in the communities, when we're doing our part, whatever it is. So let's sit with Paul a little while at his workbench. Let's imagine him at work and see what we can learn from his actions as a tent maker. Let's look, let's look at how that profession, which he was called to do by God as part of his ministry, gave him certain freedoms. God can use anything for ministry, anything to shape us into the image of Christ, can he? Because if he can take someone like me and put me up here, anybody can do it. So let's look at some of the ways that Jesus was able to use Paul's calloused hands, his swollen knuckles, as another way to bring his message to the world. Let's ask how these freedoms which God has given you enable you to use your work at home in their work environment, your friend's environment, to share the good news with others. You know, there was a time a long time ago. Can't count back that far. Probably knocking on 30 years. But at one point in our past, in our church's past, we didn't celebrate Christmas. And the reason why was, was that we felt like Christmas was not focused on Jesus. It was focused on more paganism. You know, putting up a tree or, or um, getting gifts to give to everyone. Yeah, there's a, there's a, uh, a St. Nicholas back in the day that delivered gifts to the poor. But it's been so commercialized anymore, and they always try to figure out a way to get you to spend money. But uh, uh, so at one point in our, in our past, we didn't. And I was working at a mine over in Letcher County, and the foreman on that mine was a friend of mine. And we was there one day, and he, he just all, all of a sudden come running to me. He said, Mike, 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 don't you believe in Jesus? And he's a, he was, a, I'm not sure what kind of a preacher he was, what denomination he belonged to. He said, don't you believe in Jesus? Don't you believe that he was born of the Virgin Mary and, and that uh, he uh, died on the cross and was resurrected? I said, yeah. Why wouldn't I? Well, your friend down here said you didn't put up any Christmas lights or Christmas trees or, or anything like that. I said, and what's that got to do with Jesus? He looked at me and said, you got a point. So it, it's not about buying the gifts, putting up the trees, putting up the lights, even though that's all nice, fine, pretty, and beautiful. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things is is that uh, I don't want to bust your burble, burble your bust or whatever, but Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. I think probably every one of us knows that. Uh, that was just a day that was set aside for the whole world to, I guess, agree on and celebrate. He was born sometime probably in the fall, some say in the spring. There's no definite time frame other than that the shepherds were tending to the flocks at night, and you don't do that in wintertime. So there's some points in there that, uh, that kind of lets you know that December 25th was not the day. And we don't know the day. The day is not important. Um, so anyway, I thought that was interesting that, that my friend asked me that. And, and, and when I said, yeah, why? 
<laughs> then he told me, I said, oh, okay, I got you then. But anyway, that, that was just a side note. So first of all, he, you know, Paul has a freedom from self. You know, do you remember, uh, brothers and sisters, how hard we worked among you in First Thessalonians? Ah, work, Eddie. Don't you remember, dear brothers and sisters, how hard we worked among you night and day we toiled to earn a, a living so that we would not be a burden to any of you as we preached God's good news to you? You yourselves are our witnesses, and so is God, that we were devout and honest and faultless toward all of you believers. Now, it's one of the things that our pastoral team is here is that uh, at the next board meeting, I was going to bring this up, that I want triple pay. I don't know how much Ron Debbie's going to ask for, but <laughs> but you know here's Paul um, doing his job of his everyday job of being a tent maker, and yet he was part of a, a, a pastoral team, if you want to call it. But these verses are grouped among metaphors of Paul's care for them that, and that relationship he had to them. In one chapter, he says he was like a father, even a mother, and then a child, all expressing an intimate relationship to share not only his message, but also himself with all of those guys. I can remember back when I was in, I think it was YOU, I can remember Eddie being the, uh, at that time, I think Eddie might have been working at a different location, but he was doing some, uh, keeping our chainsaws sharpened. And we went over to um, Feds Creek, and there's a lady needing some firewood. And so, oh, I don't know, there was probably eight or ten chainsaws going at one time as we was cutting this, uh, our youth group and putting them plus the adults that was there. You can't turn kids loose with a chainsaw, of course. And uh, especially if you can't, if adults can't do it. But anyway, Eddie stayed busy uh, keeping our chain sharpening and when one popped off, he'd put it back on. And, you know, I, making a difference in someone's life. We had this huge truckload of firewood that this uh, lady wanted that we cut up for her. And I can remember also with our sister church uh, over in Hazard, there was a gentleman by the name of Charlie Combs, and he, he had he'd been in a wheelchair since he was probably around 18 or 19. And, of course, he didn't was not able to, to do anything around his house. And so our two churches got together and went over there and, and cut down some old trees and cleaned up some brush, painted his house. Uh, There's probably 50 of us over there working that day, making a difference in someone's life. And then we had a big picnic afterwards. That's what, that's what topped it off. It was worth it, every bit of it, absolutely. But things like that, you know, it, it doesn't have to be me up here or Debbie up here or Ron up here. It's what you do in talking with people, sharing what you've experienced. Because I, I remember at work, we'd always um, start out what we really actually was doing at work was getting our boss on a conversation so we wouldn't have to start to work. And a lot of times it ended up in, uh, there was one, two, three, four, four or five that worked there that all four or five of us went to different churches. But we'd always get into some kind of a conversation about church. 
So that was uh, that was pretty neat. Nobody, you know, nobody was arguing or anything with the other. We just discussed things, and that was pretty good. I enjoyed that, especially getting out of work. <laughs> Another aspect of Paul's witness is unlike Paul, most pastors did not do manual labor like this. In that society back then, speakers and teachers would have been supported by their disciples, by a wealthy patron, or by believing in the community. Society considered it beneath someone like Paul to work with his hands. And I can tell you, I think this pastoral team works with their hands and and that's just uh, because, you know, I know I get paid three times more than what Ron does. <laughs> and five times more than what Davey does. I can vouch for him. He works. <laughs> At least two days. <laughs> At least two days. And for those of you that out there that know, doesn't know, of course, we don't get paid. This is all volunteer work, and, and we enjoy it. We've made a lot of good friends over the years, a lot of good friends. Met a lot of people. Believe it, we've met people all around the world, and that's been a, a tremendous, tremendous blessing. You know, people didn't go to workers in the marketplace for wisdom and theology, but yet there was Paul. There he is, was at his workbench. Well, this one really would have been a little bit tough for me to do. But Paul was right there between the fish sellers <laughs> and the con artist. And I'm not referring to the con artist. <laughs> I can't stand fish. <laughs> I can't stand fish at all. I can put up with a con artist, but I hate fish. <laughs> But his work, Paul's work, gave him freedom from self. God used his simple trade to help shape Paul into the image of Christ. And he can do us all that way. Whatever, you're, whatever it is that you do you know, can make a difference in someone's life when you get to know them. Amen. You know, the speaking and the preaching which he was trained for, that Paul was trained for, seemed to come naturally to him. But it was not his calling for making a living. Now, that's an interesting irony there that Peter was a rough-cut, professional fisherman. Not one of these polished preachers, I guess you might would say. I can remember also... One time that uh, uh, we was having a some type of a seminar or something, and I think someone was telling the story. We would uh, we would get in uh, these tables of four, five, six, and uh, it might been they might have been 150 people there or something like that. But we'd just get in small groups and we would pray. And but anyway, this one person was telling about the little group that he was with. This guy walked up to their group and sat down, and he had, <clears throat> he had his biker clothes on, his leathers, and he had all these little patches all over his jacket, long beard, long hair, and he thought, this guy doesn't need to be up here. There, there's just something wrong with this picture. He said, of all the ones at that table, that man said the best prayer of that group. Can't judge a book by its cover. Amen. It's all about the heart. We, we like to uh, judge people, don't we, on maybe how they look, dress, whatever they might do. I know I was... Um, the company I worked for in the beginning was people that were of faith. And when we'd have a meeting, they would ask uh, someone to say a prayer before the meeting started. 
And I remember this, I didn't know this guy was, uh, was a Christian. And they asked, uh, they asked him one day, and I tell you, I said, wow. He gave an awesome prayer. You never know when you're called upon. But here Peter was thrust into this role of a speaker and teacher and was supported by the communities. He administered to Paul. He ministered to. Paul was a professionally trained communicator. I can see that in him. Out there at men in these tents and always having a conversation with, with people. Telling them about Jesus. No, he was called to make ends meet by doing work that was considered demeaning. But he made the best of it. I can remember the first time, and Debbie, I, I know I always ask you this question. I can't remember how long ago that was. But has, has, it, been over, has it been over 20 years? <laughs> In the 18 years. I mean, it was getting close to that 20. But our... Uh, um, Pastor had resigned, and our district pastor came up to visit and said, uh, we need somebody to take his place. And he asked about people being interested, and of course, nobody wanted to. <laughs> and, uh, but... Uh, Debbie, myself, my dad agreed to, and then I went from one week just coming in like you guys and sitting and listening to a message to the next Sunday having to give a message. Now, I can tell you, God is good. <laughs> oh, they really bailed me out. And uh, that was, uh, it's hard to believe it's been 18 years ago now. But imagine sitting in a lecture hall, walls that are laid out of mahogany, chairs finished with fine leather, the best that you can buy. And just as the class is about to begin, after a rousing uh, introduction by a quartet, the custodian, the janitor, walks up to the podium clears his throat, and he proceeds to give the most brilliant lecture anyone's ever heard. Well, it's kind of a bit like that with Paul, the tent maker. It'd be like Paul walking in and speaking. A tent maker. Paul's work, which brought him down in the eyes of society, gave him a freedom from self that let him preach the gospel with joyful abandon. Wasn't under any really strict restrictions. And also it gave him a freedom from status. Now if you look around the world today, uh, people always want to be at the top of the totem pole, don't they? 1 Thessalonians 2 9 says, Don't you remember, dear brothers and sisters, how hard we worked among you? Night and day we toiled to earn a living so that we would not be a burden to any of you as we preach God's good news to you. Worked hard, toiled long and hard. Now, this is something that Paul mentions in several places. In different letters, when he tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 9, 11 and 12 says, Since we have planted spiritual seed among you, aren't we entitled to a harvest of physical food and drink? If you support others who preach to you, should we have an even greater right to be supported? But we have never used this right. We would rather put up with anything than be an obstacle to the good news about Christ. Not about, not about the money. Now, a lot of churches have paid pastors. 
And you can hear this in Paul's dialogue with different communities. He didn't burden them financially and was specific about avoiding that. Now, we don't have a wealthy church here. We got bills to pay. We got rent to pay. But God has blessed us tremendously. In Jewish society at the time, the rabbi was supported by his community as a, as a matter of course. There was no question about where his check was coming from as it was part of tithing to your local synagogue. Paul wouldn't participate in this. He didn't want it. He didn't want it to become an obstacle between him and the people. He was one of the, what we would say, a down-to-earth person. He fit in. He didn't want to stand out above the crowd. And Paul walked away from all that and sat there on the workbench. That was his podium. It was his workbench. Nobody could accuse him of preaching a new message so he could make money. He was driven entirely by the mission God had given him. I would like to think that our pastoral team is driven that way as well with the things that, uh, that's being done. And, you know, and of course, Debbie does a fantastic job with her, with her ministry in the community. That everybody knows her. They don't know me and Ron. Well, they might know Ron. I don't know. <laughs> right there's the face. Yep. <coughs> Has your faith ever brought you to this kind of freedom? Has it brought you to where you can stand away from the constant competing and status in the center of attention. In the corporate world, it's hard to do that because everybody was trying to get to the top of the ladder. No matter what it takes to get there. But Paul was not like that. I left my phone. I was going to do something. But anyway, I'll tell you. you know, social media makes this even worse. <laughs> do you agree with that? You know, our social media, we can update in lightning fast real time. All aspects of our lives and then wait anxiously for a, a approval. I'm, now, I'm, I'm one of these people that when someone <coughs> says, if you'll do this, you'll be that, blessed or whatever. I don't, I, mean, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I don't have to do, do that. Or someone will say, I want to see how many copies and paste this. Well, I don't even know how to copy and paste. <laughs> 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 so I told Christine, uh, I don't know if it, was, if it was yesterday or something, somebody says, I, mean, I, I, I liked it, and I said, Come over here and copy and paste this for me. <laughs> so I'm not uh, too savvy on the high tech. Um, so Christine has to bail me out all the time. <laughs> but it's, it's amazing. I mean, what can happen now, almost instantaneously, everybody knows. It's a matter of just seconds and of course a lot of it's good and a lot of it's no good now but Jesus tells us that we are loved cherished and destined no matter what we got a place that we're going out of this world yeah. and you don't have to wear a mask. <laughs> we'll get rid of those masks then. You know, he reminds us that our worth isn't a matter of works, smarts, or looks. Well, Ron, you struck out there. But of his grace. 
that's all that matters is God's grace. Paul wasn't tempted or distracted by these positions of status like the rabbis were. He just sat down at his workbench and was free. Write it on. Second Thessalonians 2. And you know that we treated each of you as a father treats his own children. We pleaded with you, encouraged you, urged you to live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy. For he called you to share in his kingdom and glory. That's what we should be doing. You can find this story. I didn't, I didn't put it on, on the scripture. But you can find it in Acts 17. The Thessalonian church was a flashpoint in Paul's ministry as discussed in Acts 17. He's preaching almost resulted in a riot. That sounds bad. Like, well, I might stir up. Believers were alienated from their cultures, whether it is Jewish or pagan, and the tension was bad enough to cause violence. And Paul and Silas were hidden by the community, and then they were released at night to go to the next town. Think about this. This is preaching God's word. And they were after them. And, you know, the people from Thessalonica found them. They'd follow them wherever they went. You know, in this kind of environment, we're disowned from our families and cultures. It's no surprise that the church there got obsessed on these end times. Now, we've seen that in our lifetime around here. I mean, I'm sure everybody has, has seen something. In other words, somebody has predicted when the end of time is going to happen. Well, that's today. Same thing happened back then. Time has not changed in, in that aspect. You know, they became focused and paranoid with the second coming to the point that some of them would quit their jobs. Christ is coming back tomorrow night. I don't need to work. They were even coming to the point of disengaging from a, a lifestyle. They were simply just watching the sky letting their lives fall apart because they thought Christ was going to return in their lifetime. That's been over 2,000 years ago. <coughs> and we're still looking today. But the Bible tells us no man knows the day or the hour, does he? We don't have a clue. Only God the Father knows. And he said that the world will be marrying, giving in marriage, is doing their everything. Now you look around at our world right now and it is horrible. I mean just let me back up and say look at our country. It's horrible. Chaos everywhere. And and people thinks that They've got the right to go in and destroy someone's business and take whatever's in there. What kind of a country are we becoming? That's what happens when you kick God out. When you kick him out, that's what happens. You know, Paul was at his workbench. He stood in stark contrast to this. Instead of a kind of apocalyptic obsession, he participated in one of the most consistent examples of human life. He worked. He worked. Just an everyday job. Listen to this, his explicit instruction to the community there. You yourselves are our witnesses. You are the witnesses. And so is God, that we were devout and honest and faultless toward all of you believers. I forgot to put that up on screen. There we go. Verse 11, and you know that we treated each of you as a father treats his own children. 
but he pleaded with you, encouraged you, urged you to live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy. For he called you to share in his kingdom and glory. Called us, each one of us here. We're not just accidentally happened to be here. Each one of us pay, plays a role in God's ministry. You know, what a shocking thing to say to a doomsday community. Here they were hiding in bunkers, waiting for the deliverance to come, and Paul says, get to work. Get to work. Live a quiet life. Work with your hands. Let that be your witness. Do the job. You know, he doesn't offer them fireworks and drama. He offers them a life well lived in the moment. Because you know how it's going to end. We've read the end of the, or the end of the book in the last chapter. We know how it's going to end. And you could live more fully in the moment knowing that. We win. We don't lose. We win. Because you know it's how it's going to end, you can live more fully in that moment. You know, Jesus, Paul, and the other apostles didn't offer them a wait for it to end times scenario, but he gave them the key to live a different life, an everyday life, even in the details of the workbench. It's just as simple as going out and filling up the Blessing box. <laughs> they seem to be coming more often. <laughs> the gospel life calls us to this daily work. And I know a lot of you guys work hard here. As a matter of fact, I even come, I thought we put down new carpet. But I think somebody gave it a good cleaning. Thank you, Jason. James ever had his hand in on it. Looks good. It calls us to the difficult journey of helping the poor. Well, I'm poor. It calls us to the seemingly endless grace work of Christ being formed in us and all that you do. Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again. And they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. Now this, this gospel is not an escapist doctrine that relieves us of our responsibilities and our tensions in life. It gives us strength to press further into, into life. This has not been one of my better weeks that I've had this past week. It's uh, been a tough week. I had the one night that I got zero hours of sleep. You know, going through being laid off and going through, do I call it quits? Going through getting sermon ready, <laughs> going through whatever. And, of course, I don't handle stress very well. Of course, I have anxiety issues. But I knew who was going to get me through today. It gives us strength to press further into life. You know, Paul at his workbench gives us an example. It was a great example of someone who was holding on to two realities in tension. On one hand, he isn't blinded by the world, trying to make heaven on earth through his business dealings and influence the status of his life. But on the other hand, he isn't watching the skies either. He's not obsessed over signs 
of Christ's return. He's in the real world, and we are too, living every day in light of eternity and therefore being able to fully live every day. May you know the freedom of being a fully loved child of God because you are. And may you follow Paul's example, not necessarily to make tense, but may you follow Paul's example but to be free from status obsession. I'll take places if you want to take my place up here. Not necessarily to make tense, but to be free from status obsession. End times asphyxiation. Sometimes you can see people that are just, wow, that's unbelievable. But then the ultimate slavery of living for yourself. For the son, S-O-N, has set you free. And you are free indeed. And we can't wait to throw away those masks. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you for pointing us in the directions that you want us to go, Lord, being instrumental in making a difference in the, in the community. You know, we don't know the day or the hour or the time, only you. And you told us to be about your business. And that's what we want to be doing not watching the calendar or the clocks or the signs, but serving you, making a difference to different people in whatever scenario may be. I thank you have blessed our church tremendously. I thank you for all the people that you have placed in our fellowship here, Lord. Those that come and visit, we, are just, we appreciate those folks very, very much, Lord. This is a good place to be. And we ask for your blessing and your guidance as we go forward, Lord, of the things that you want us to do, how you want us to do it. I know that if you show us the way, we'll, we'll go, Lord. I've seen this church over the years. Say, if you open the door, we'll go through it. And every time that you've opened the door, we've always gone through it. And we know that you were leading us and you were placing us where you wanted us to be. So I ask your blessing on everyone here today, Lord. Touch them in a special way. Show your love to them. Help them to understand the sacrifice that you gave and that ultimate place that we get to spend eternity with you. God speed that day in Jesus' name. Amen.